that was a really cool conversation, Dimitrios. I'm I'm glad that we were able to get Donna and Christos on and, and learn so much from them. Yeah, for sure. So for those who don't know, uh, Donna and Christos are working at Google. They're working at Google Cloud and they are behind some of these uh, papers and blog posts that have been circulating. And most recently, there's like a best practices of MLOps. I get titles wrong so much, Vishnu, and I know that's not the <laughs> title. What is the real title of that? Uh, it's like an ebook. What's the real title, man? Help me out here. It's the Practitioner's Guide to MLOps, which is a nice. really comprehensive and great overview. If you're an ML engineer, ML platform engineer, software engineer, machine learning, whatever you might be, it is a great hands-on guide to how to assess what capabilities you need and where you might be on the different maturity levels and how to assess what investments you want to make in what portions of your tech stack. Really cool. Yeah. And we had some of the authors of that on in Donna and Christos. Yeah, obviously we'll link to that in the show notes if you want to just jump to it and read. But what did you think? How was the conversation? What were some key takeaways for you, Vishnu? So we've had on a couple people from Google on this podcast before, but the Google verse is so big that you can have very, you can have people on that are technically from the same company and have very different perspectives. So, you know, we've had on Todd Underwood, who was a senior technology executive focused on SRE. We've had on Lack. We've had on other D. people. Scully. And D. Scully, right? So many people. But what Donna and Christos focus on in particular is really solutions engineering and focus on external customers for Google Cloud and building for their needs and then turning that into capabilities on the GCP platform. And it was really interesting to get their lens on how to think about customer needs in ML, how structured their thinking is, and then how they turn that structured thinking both into best practices and knowledge for the community through thought leadership, and also into real products that end up becoming part of the GCP platform. I thought it was cool to get an inside look into that. That's a great point. That is so cool. So let's just give a, a quick intro and read off their bios and then we'll jump into the full conversation. Donna Schultz is a solutions manager at Google Cloud, responsible for designing, building, and bringing to market smart analytics and AI solutions globally. She's passionate about pushing the boundaries of our thinking with new technologies and creating solutions that have a positive impact. Previously, before Google, she was a technical account manager overseeing the delivery of large-scale ML projects and a part of the AI practice developing tools, processes, and solutions for successful ML adoption. She managed and co-authored Google Cloud's AI adoption framework and pr practitioner's guide, as we just mentioned. What about Christos? You want to give it a go? Sure. Christos is a machine learning engineer with a focus on the end-to-end -end ML ecosystem. On a typical day, Christos helps Google customers productionize their ML workloads using Google Cloud products and services with special attention to scalable and maintainable ML environments. He made his ML debut in 2010 while working at Digital MR, where he led a team of data scientists and developers to build a social media monitoring and analytics tool for the market research sector. Some very cool people. Amazing. Yeah, and that's true. Like, yeah, he hit the nail on the head when he talks about on a typical day, Christos helps Google customers productionize their ML workloads. That's pretty obvious from the conversation that we had. He's he's knee deep in that and trying to help them. So awesome, man. Last thing I'll say before we actually run the conversation, we are looking for people to help us edit these videos and podcasts. And what does that mean? You probably are thinking, I'm not an editor. This can't be me. We've got editors. That's not the problem. We know how to use the software to edit the tools that you need. That doesn't matter. We just want to hear what are the gems of the conversations so we can make highlight reels. And you're probably thinking to yourself, we'll hire somebody like an editor to do that. Problem is video editors and producers of podcasts, they don't really know much about machine learning. So we've had some trouble finding people that are capable of finding the gems and finding, oh, wow, that's a great little clip. You should probably make that into its own standalone clip or throw it into the highlight reel. And that's because 
it's complicated stuff. The normal editors and producers think that everything is, they're either too bullish or too shy when they are editing. They'll either cut out stuff that is actually important or mm -hmm. they'll be too shy and they'll just leave everything in. And we want to try and make those highlight reels so people can digest a 10 minute version of these conversations. If you don't want to listen to Vishnu and I chit chat for the first five minutes of the conversation and you just want to get well, right to the not? learnings. Yeah, I mean, some people, I guess. Uh, so we're trying to serve all these needs. We're thinking about you all. So help us out. If you want to volunteer and help us with this editing, all you got to do is say from second 45 to second 55, that was a good little part. You should add that. And then we take care of the rest. It's that easy. We just want to hear from you listeners. Help us source the best parts of the episodes. All right, that's it. Let's get to the actual conversation. I want to start with why you all created the, the incredible, like it's an ebook, it's a paper, it's, I don't know what, exactly what you want to call it, but where did the inspiration for the MLOps best practices come from? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So um, I think, you know, we're always inspired by uh, our customers, right? I think the customers are really at the heart of everything that we do. Um, we, you know, based off of a lot of customer conversations, we found a lot of asks around this, right? More around the focus on the processes of MLOps. Right? Prior to that, we had kind of two guides on more of the, the technical architecture side. Uh, we published a, a more kind of a broader AI adoption framework as well. And as these follow-on conversations, um, you know, as we were having them, we were finding that this is where customers were asking kind of the most. And so um, as we were going through this process, we decided to, to share this more broadly. Got it. And, you know, thanks again for joining us, Donna. I really appreciate it. I want to start with your focus is you're a solutions manager at Google Cloud and I'm kind of interested in, maybe you can tell us about what your model is for working with customers and how you guys get that sort of feedback in the process of your daily job. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, so we work with customers uh, typically in kind of the incubation phase, you know, as we're kind of starting to uh, design and, and build these solutions. So. Uh, meeting regularly with customers to understand what their requirements are, uh, where they're facing challenges, um, and then working with them to, you know, pilot some of these solutions, um, having this iterative process of, you know, constantly improving it uh, with input from a variety of teams uh, internally as well, right? So our, we get a lot of uh, great input from all the cross-functional teams across Alphabet who are working on this. Um, and then, you know, uh, work with customers to land it. Once we've seen that, you know, repeatedly, um, then we'll typically also publish something. Got it. So, Christos, you're an ML engineer and you've worked with customers at Google Cloud. And I must say, you know, in our conversations, we hear very positive reviews about how Google Cloud is enabling ML ops and allowing custom companies to move a lot faster with the entire stack of services you guys offer for machine learning. From your standpoint, working with external companies, but also sitting internal to Google Cloud, can you tell us where we're at with MLOps? Yeah, of course. Um, so we we do, as you said, work with, with a lot of customers and we try to adapt to our customer needs. Uh, we feel that, um, you know, we spend Maybe three years ago, we were talking to customers about, hey, what is machine learning and how they can productionize a single machine learning model. Uh, and then those conversations transitioned to perhaps spending the last two years talking about MLOps, right? Because, okay, how do you do that at scale? How do you do that in a way that helps the whole organization and not individual teams? And then only the last year, we've seen uh, big organizations trying to really build those MLOps platforms and try to bring this to life. And our role is to help them achieve that. And because you mentioned, you know, like how do I see it within Google, but also working with customers, it's very important to, to mention that it's, you know, we are, we are touching on, on two different worlds and we learn from internally, but also we are very conscious that not everybody is Google and not everybody operates at Google scale. 
And, uh, you know, like we, we don't want to kind of impose that, um, you know, everybody has, you know, petabytes of data. And, and therefore we try to kind of adapt our solutions in different scenarios, depending on different customer needs. And, and, and therefore, again, the, the point here is that we, we do get inspiration from within, but we listen to our customers in order to bring things to, to the market, things that they can solve the problems they have today. And can you talk about some of these different things? Like, what does the process look like? You sit there and you hear from people that they need X, Y, Z, and you hear it enough times, and then you go and build it, or you ask for a PM to build it. What does that look like? Yeah, that's that, that's a good question. So, so we do work with customers, and we do understand kind of the the needs, the frameworks that they are using, how they are using them, the kind of scale of data they have. And of course, they're testing and trying our products. And from that, we, we get feedback. And that feedback ends up uh, with the product team. And of course, the, the popular ones, they, they get a priority. And, and, and again, we, it's, it's not like following a feedback and going blindly and building a feature. We, we really need to understand the need for the feature, how it helps uh, you know, like all of our customer portfolio. But also, like, are there any workarounds, any any quick wins, um, anything else that they, they can benefit from the broader GCP Google Cloud uh, platform ecosystem, and not just from the Vertex AI products? I really appreciate the customer centricity that you're sharing. is clearly a core value of, of how you both of your teams work and how you both approach your your work. And I also really appreciate your comment, Christos, about how not everybody is Google. And there's a famous blog post about it from the Brad LCS school. And, and we've all talked we about it. We reference it, in it so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's great to read all the content that comes out of a company like Google in terms of how ML is applied. But most of us aren't working at that scale. And I think it's important that you, you know, have highlighted that. What I want to ask about now is your white paper that Dimitrios referenced, The Practitioner's Guide to ML Ops. I thought it was really excellent and it gave a lot of frameworks for how to think about the field. Could you provide a brief overview of the processes and the capabilities, Donna, that are outlined in that white paper and how you guys have seen that advice applied in the real world ecosystem? Sure, yeah, and uh, you know, glad you found it useful. Um, I think that we always, you know, we try to create content and we hope that it's, uh, it's useful for others. So it's, it's great to get that feedback. Um, so in the uh, framework, we outline six uh, integrated uh, and iterative processes, right? So starting with ML development, so experimentation and, and prototyping, uh, training operationalization, so automating the process of packaging, testing, and deploying training pipelines, um, then continuous training, so repeatedly executing the training pipeline, and that can be, for example, in response to new data or uh, on a schedule. Um, model deployment, so, you know, packaging, testing, and deploying a model to a serving environment uh, for online experimentation and um, production serving. And by online experimentation, we mean kind of production testing, uh, prediction serving, uh, so serving the model that's deployed in production for inference, um, continuous monitoring, right, so identifying and predicting uh, model performance degradation, data drift, uh, outliers, for example, and then at the heart of these processes, uh, data and model management, right, which um, is a central function for essentially governing ML artifacts. And that supports audibility, traceability, uh, compliance, but also, you know, shareability, reusability, and uh, discoverability. Um, and then we, we outline the capabilities that uh, are necessary uh, for these processes, right? And one of the things that we, we kind of emphasize as well is that many organizations already have existing investments in infrastructure and security, uh, CICD, um, and those can be leveraged uh, for these ML workflows. Uh, and then there's the, you know, the core ML ops uh, capabilities uh, on top of those, right? So ML metadata and artifact tracking, um, ML pipelines, and so on. Um, and yeah, I think to your question of, you know, how it's applied, so I think typically what we see is that these are being kind of deployed in phases, not all at once. Uh, so organizations, may, they tend to initially kind of focus on um, ML development, model deployment, uh, prediction serving, 
Um, I think as, as Christos also was mentioning earlier, right, it kind of depends on if you just have like a few ML systems, you, you may not need like the continuous training and continuous monitoring. Um, and we've worked with, with customers in kind of two ways. So I think one is kind of actually, you know, building the platform. So for example, we worked with uh, a telco where they had a variety of regional teams kind of running similar models. So for example, you could say you have uh, a team doing a propensity model for marketing campaigns uh, in the US and in the UK, right? And um, they have different local requirements. Um, and so, but at the same time, that work can be leveraged. So kind of creating these templates, right, saves time, but at the same time, uh, they were able to make the adjustments that they needed. And then uh, the other would be on a kind of use case basis where uh, for faster time to market, right, some, some companies opt to kind of uh, adopt these capabilities by use case. And so uh, we have, for example, media company that we worked with where we uh, worked on particular use cases like recommendations or audience segmentation. And um, yeah, I think one of the most common questions that we got as we were doing is, this is, is really, you know, do you need all of the capabilities and all of these processes? Um, and so that's actually what led us to, to write that other article around, you know, how do you select uh, these ML ops capabilities by uh, use case? So there's something interesting there, and I love all of the basically knowledge sharing that comes out of Google, really, especially in the ML and ML ops field. It seems like all of the classic papers have come out of Google, and you, whether that's like the high interest uh, credit card debt, <laughs> which I can never say that title correctly, but it, I think everyone who's read it knows exactly what I'm talking about, or the, the ML test score, and then even the, um, the continuous training paper, which again, I'm probably not getting the name of that correctly, but we'll link to all of those in the description. And one thing that I wonder about when you're creating these frameworks, like in this continuous training, and hopefully you guys know which paper I'm referencing when I'm saying the continuous training um, blog post, that it's, it's really cool to see the different maturity levels, right? So you have like maturity level zero and what that looks like, maybe what some some architecture choices can be. And then when you want to go to maturity level one, maturity level two, what those can look like. The thing that I wonder about on this is because ML is so vast of a practice. And when you're looking at these different maturity levels, some of the things that you reference in the different phases they may or may not be useful for certain types of ML applications. So how do you look at like these ways of doing it where you say, okay, well maybe for structured data, this is a really solid architecture design, or this is a really solid way of choosing how I'm going to basically set up my system. But then if it's a different use case, like you were mentioning like, oh, well, maybe now we have a computer vision use case and we need to take different things into account like um, with uh, looking at unstructured data or however it may be. And then on top of that, like even going a layer deeper, you can say, we really value low latency or we really value the, um, the accuracy or whatever it is that you're valuing there. How do those architectures come into play? And then like, I think the, the real question here for you is how do you synthesize all of that data and then try and create something that you can package up and give to people so it can help them along on their journeys? And maybe Christos, I'll, I'll throw this one over to you. And Don, if you have anything that you want to add in after he chimes in, then feel free to. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent, uh, excellent question. So the, it, it is a challenge to just create something that serves everybody. Right, and, and that's why we try to generalize a bit and, and provide some guidelines when we create either an architecture or a you know or a guide on selecting the right capabilities, for example. And I think uh, I will talk a bit more about the blog post around selecting the right capabilities because it's it's very related to to what you said. Um, so that blog post, by the way, it was co-authored with with Donna and, Lar and Larissa Suzuki. So uh, big shout out to them. Um, and essentially, it explains how the journey should look like for organizations that they have uh, use cases in mind. So creating an MLOps platform is, is a different beast than creating few ML capabilities. 
So it's easy to say, okay, I will set up a feature store and use it. It's easy to say, yeah, we have a training service. But once you start creating a platform, it means that, okay, that platform should use a lot of capabilities, maybe not all of them, but a lot of capabilities, but you should also take care into, take into consideration access to the platform, access to data, security, uh, how does and what data scientists can do on the platform, what ML engineers can do on this platform, how do you escalate assets from development staging. So it's a beast. And it takes a lot of time to build kind of the, let's say, the best possible ML platform. And we don't advise people to try and land there. We say, OK, take your use case or a few use cases and think of you know, what you need to solve those use cases. So perhaps organizations, they might be dealing, let's say, 70% of the times with structured data. And therefore, now we narrow down kind of the priority is to solve for this structured data. And what we do from there is we say, OK, so um, what capabilities do we need to solve for this structured data? Or you know, if it's critical workloads you know, that basically the, that we're dealing with, then what capabilities do we need for that? So the blog post explains how you can pick those capabilities based on a use case and build them as part of your MLOps platform. So you prioritize based on that. And in the future, when you have a new use case, maybe now I'm dealing with images and I need different capabilities, then what you do is you go and you build that additional capabilities that, that you might need. And slowly, you start from kind of a basic MLOps platform that starts becoming more transformational because you start building good things and better things and more capabilities within. And yes, maybe some use cases, they, don't, they didn't really need a feature store. But once you built it, you might as well use it you know, if, if it's a good idea. So things like, OK, I don't really need continuous training, but now I have it. And it's kind of it's a click of a button. I can use it. Why not use it for use cases that might not need it? Or why you know, not use continuous integration and delivery even if I don't change the base of my code, which means I don't get a big advantage. But again, if you reach the stage where you build the that capability, you can as well use it for all of your use cases. So it's this, again, back to your question, I want to highlight that it's this incremental process. And you know, like don't try to build the best, just try to build for your use case and have your use case as guide, basically the guide on what to do next. So in our community, we have a lot of avid readers of content like yours. And what traditionally happens is someone, honestly, someone like me, one machine learning engineer sitting in a company or a startup says, hey, maybe there's ways that we can be doing things a little bit better. And they read a Google Cloud blog post or two, and they say, hey, I'm at MLOps maturity level zero or one, or these are my use cases, and these are the capabilities I need. And then they come into the community and they say, this is what I'm thinking. How are you guys thinking about it? And we end up having a lot of great discussion from that. And that is how we have learned that your content and, and, and your sort of thought leadership has been really invaluable to the overall state of the art. I want to flip that sort of question back to you and say, how do you see your customers read and learn about their level of maturity, let's say, or what level of capabilities they may have or need? And what does the professional mix look like? Are these engineers? Are these project managers, product managers, or more senior technical executives? Donna, can you give us a little bit of context about this discovery process? Um, sure, yeah. So um, I guess maybe first of all, in terms of um, you know, who's the audience? I think that that really, it depends on the type of content, right? So uh, we created the AI adoption framework, which is more for kind of technical leaders to think about, uh, you know, what uh, what's needed to build an AI capability that goes, you know, across uh, also to, you know, what kind of people do you need to hire, the sponsorship, like there's a lot outside of it. The uh, the practitioner's guide was more oriented, you know, as the <laughs> title indicates, towards practitioners and architects and uh, engineers. Um, and yeah, I would say that the the article around kind of selecting the right uh, capabilities for your use case is also more oriented at uh, practitioners. But you know, we see kind of interaction from 
across the board. Um, and I think in terms of the way that we interact with customers, it would be really with a, a variety of roles, right? I think that um, having a cross-functional team is really important in a lot of these endeavors, right? And that's actually where I think we see one of uh, the main challenges as well is, you know, what is that, uh, you know, what kind of skill set should be hired? What does that, that team composition look like? Um, and so, yeah, I think that's kind of the, the first part of your question is around kind of who are we interacting with? Um, does that answer your question or did you have kind of more specific questions around the process? I think that does answer the, the question. It seems like cross-functionality is really important. I'm curious what level of sort of sort of disciplines and seniority mix you tend to see. Is it usually more senior people that are coming and starting these conversations or is it more of a bottom-up movement? Um, I think it really depends on the organization. Um, and that makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I think in 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 our experience, we tend to see a lot of the bottom up sort of discussion happens, you know, someone who wants to be an evangelist within their company. And that is not as we don't see as much of, you know, maybe a senior executive kind of saying, hey, this is a sort of broad enterprise level strategy that I want to adopt. Uh, I think Demetrius has a question, so I'm going to I'm going to kick it to him. So. I want to, uh, yeah, I, I want to keep going back to these blogs and papers. And so if you, if you want to move on and you're like, I'm sick of talking about this, tell me. But there's something super interesting in my mind knowing about the papers and the frameworks. And, and since it came out uh, a few months ago, right? Well, the blog came out, I don't know if it was a year ago, but it, it feels like it may have been a year ago. Correct me if I'm wrong, Donna. Like less, a little less than a year ago, probably. Because I feel like I was talking about it with David on here. We did like a whole series breaking it down uh, on on this podcast when it came out, which I feel like was, yeah, last March or maybe February. I can't remember. Anyway, uh -huh. the question that I have is really around, <laughs> and this might be totally ridiculous. I'm just going to preface the question with that. Is there a level, a next level up since you wrote that? paper or the blog, is there like a level three now that you would say, okay, since I've seen more and I'm starting to see that as a industry in general, we're maturing now, I would say that there's probably these other things that I would have added. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Um, I think that you know, I think to your point earlier in terms of where we're at with uh, with MLOps now, right? I think that we kind of initially there was this uh, the first wave of kind of companies that built their own uh, in-house capabilities, um, and then now we're actually because of you know new tooling that's become available, um, it's making it much more kind of accessible and it saves a lot of other companies time to do the same, and so what we're seeing is that, um, you know, there's a lot more kind of companies starting to adopt them a lot. And then at the same time, we also see uh, kind of that first wave, right, starting to maybe modernize their platform, adopt some of that tooling. Uh, I think, you know, lately there was an article by ST, uh, which was a great example. I can send that to you as well, uh, where they start to adopt some of that tooling, you know, maybe shed some of the technical debt and, uh, you know, they move to more of a, a self-service model because that was more familiar to their users with great results. So um, I think that's kind of how we're seeing it evolve, um, you know, and it's still very much a, a dynamic and evolving space. Um, and so, I, yeah, I would say that that's kind of what we're seeing in the landscape at the moment. Yeah, and I love that you mentioned uh, that I think it's it, it's really funny because I was I was thinking oh well maybe there's some kind of new store that Donna's going to tell us about that we need to put in our architecture diagrams as the new hot thing, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it is true I think actually the person who wrote that uh, Kyle from from Etsy he was on here oh, great. and he was talking about that and it really it parallels what we were talking about last week uh, with Jesse about how you see that pattern where there are those people that were starting ML a few years too early. Well, not too early, but just a few years ago before there was all these offerings out there and they had to build it themselves. And then they're reaching a point where they're saying, wow, maybe this is easier to just go and buy something because the offerings are now reaching a maturity level. 
Uh, so yeah, that's that's really cool to see. Vishnu, I had I know you had one. Hit it. Okay, so Christos, I want to talk to you about maybe it's real, maybe it's hypothetical, but a sort of case study or a company case study that you've worked on where you had to talk to the customer, understand their needs, and apply some of the ideas that are in the Practitioner's Guide to MLOps and any of your other blog posts or, or papers. Can you tell us about maybe one example that stands out either for its success or for its failures? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, w when we work with, uh, with customers for kind of building an MLOps platform, we, we do use the Practitioner's Guide to MLOps as kind of the starting point, right? Because that helps understand kind of what needs to be done and, and the landscape. Um, I think that on the back of that, selecting the right career is that's kind of a, a super important piece because it helps you scope the piece of work, as we said earlier, on what you need to do first. Um, and, and I can give an example, you know, it can be hypo hypothetical, but it helps you kind of understand how you go about, you know, picking the right capabilities. So um, let's say that you have um, a use case where you want to analyze text from a call center, maybe it's transcripts, in order to understand, you know, how customers complain perhaps, but also how you can improve your customer service. So if we take that as a use case, um, we need to kind of start going through each characteristic for that use case that applies as described into, into our blog post. So let's say, first of all, is that use case mission critical? Analyzing call center data for internal reports, right? So let's say the, the manager of a call center wants to see a report. Um, is that mission critical? Well, I, I would say it's not because the model is used internally within the organization. Um, it doesn't expose anything to, to our customers. And how we classify mission critical is basically, would it have any financial or reputation impact to my business if there is something wrong with this model? And I don't think that will be the case because again, it's a report that the manager will see within. If, if they see the report that it's very odd, they will say, hey, there's something wrong with this report, but it's not a big deal, right? So the fact that it's not mission critical, it means that, well, okay, well, I don't need to worry about tracking all the metadata for this for this model and do artifact tracking. Um, and that might sound weird, but again, it's a guide. So we don't say, hey, it's actually useless to have metadata and artifact tracking. What we say is that, well, maybe it's not your number one priority. So just, you know, push it back and then, you know, we can revisit that later. Then we say, okay, does this use case need to have reusable and, you know, collaborative element to it? So do other pieces in my organization, other parts of the organization want to reuse this model? And then maybe, you know, the answer is yes. Let's say, okay, it's a language model, right? Um, it does sentiment analysis to understand complaints of customers. So it can be a bit generic. And therefore it's nice if someone else and different department that also has a call center capability can take this model and then utilize it. So if I want it to be shareable and reusable, I need capabilities like a model registry so that I can lock my models. I can add, tag the models with parameters. I can tag them with description, what the model does, how it can be used, uh, performance of the model. And therefore, when my colleagues in another department wants to borrow that model, download the model and use it, they, they have all the information needed. And of course, now you say, okay, now actually I also need metadata tracking and artifact tracking, right? Because, okay, now because others depend on this model and the training process of this model, it's good to provide them with all this information so that they can know exactly how I and my department train, train this model. And then you move on into, into retraining. Do you need to retrain this model frequently or only when it degrades? Well, it's a language model. So, well, maybe I don't get any benefit if I retrain it daily or weekly. Uh, I will only need to retrain it if the language changed. So that's kind of in a hundred years for perhaps, or I might need to retrain it if there are new kind of products introduced in my company. And therefore now my call center will be discussing this new product. So I don't need to, to retrain and therefore 
uh, the most important here is I do need my training service, right? Because yes, I still need to train it at least once or once every time I, I, I see the model degrading. But that's kind of the key element is model degrading. If I don't retrain my model frequently, I need to make sure that it doesn't rotten in production. It doesn't become so stale and becomes basically uh, so inaccurate. So that model monitoring element is very important for ad hoc retraining of models. Then we, we think of implementation of uh, basically core changes to the code of the model. If we want to take change the architecture or the, the code of our pipeline, if I want to keep doing that frequently. And again, the answer is you know, no, perhaps not, because if you have a model, a language model that is accurate enough, it doesn't matter to get kind of another two, three percent of accuracy. However, if that was a model that was client facing and that was my competitive advantage, maybe I, I just tune this model, kind of that's my day-to-day -day job, is tuning this model and squeezing any percentage of accuracy. And that means a lot of changes in my code. And if I do a lot of changes in my in the in the code of the model, in the algorithm, in my pipeline, it means that I need continuous integration, right? And delivery. So I need to have this process that things are getting shipped into production. In this case, uh, I don't need CICD. Again, that's an MLOps community, so kind of people will be like, what? We don't need uh, CICD. So it is a nice to have, right? So so add it, you know, like when your use case need it, but, you know, it's not a priority. It's definitely a nice to have. And, you know, like, uh, I mean, I love the concept and I love to use it, you know, uh, whenever I can. But if you want to prioritize, then just push it aside for the moment. Uh, for the time being. And then you see, okay, is it batch or online uh, serving? It's a batch serving, and therefore that means that we need to have a model serving capability for batch loads, but I don't need A-B testing. I don't need online experimentation because it's not an API that I need to keep uh, keep my eye on. So this is kind of a, a very quick scenario how you can use this, uh, these capabilities in, in, in that context. And I think the MLOps, uh, the practitioner's guide, I think that is that is very detailed. And of course, what I like about that is, you know, it focuses into the processes and doesn't really describe, okay, like specific products because that's kind of, it's, it's a great educational piece. Um, but then paired with uh, selecting the right capabilities, I think that basically brings, you know, kind of down to earth and say, okay, this is great. This is kind of a really good, platform which you can build and while you get there just here's how you can you can prioritize excellent yeah it's almost like uh go through this and use your common sense which is the least common of all the senses as they say and really <laughs> try to look at what you need the most uh, and what you don't need then you can be a bit more patient on trying to implement and or just um, scrap it all together right so there is one thing that I love to ask people, and of course, for you all, this can be very hypothetical, we could say, just to uh, cover yourselves. But I, I would love to hear about war stories. And maybe it can be someone else's war story, or even better, it could be yours and what you learned from it, what you were able to take away from it. And it doesn't have to be right now where you're working at Google. It can be in your last job or the job before that or back when you were in college. I don't care. I just think that people have written, written us. Actually, they actually I just got one last week where someone wrote me and said, the favorite part about uh, the episodes is when we have war stories. So maybe, Donna, do you have a war story that you could tell us uh, and, and what you learned from it, what, you can, what kind of takeaway you have? Sure. Um... Well, I don't know about war stories, um, but maybe I can talk through kind of some of the, the challenges or, or pain points that we see kind of going through, uh, you know, engagements with customers. So um, I think there's, there's kind of a variety of, of challenges um, across uh, different areas, right? So, for example, one of the, the first ones that we typically see is that uh, probably the most, uh, you know, successful undertakings are typically... Um, when there is a, a pull from the, the business and also a push from a platform team, right? So I think that that kind of getting that buy-in uh, is probably one of the, the main pain points that we typically see working with customers. Um, another one is, uh, I guess, from a technical standpoint, the interoperability. You know, so I've worked with customers where 
you know, they have a variety of different tooling or maybe they're using different vendors, right? And um, there's been some kind of technical challenges uh, from that perspective. And then, um, you know, another one is, we work with a lot of customers, you know, that, that may, for example, start embarking their, their journey to Google Cloud, right? And it's uh, it's also come to the completely different mindset. And so I think where, you know, for example, the way that you would manage costs, uh, you know, is very different, you know, moving from what was maybe a central team that owns that budget to actually, you know, being able to spin up and down resources really easily. Um, and so I would say that that's, that's maybe another watch point as you, you know, go along this uh, this journey is to, to think through that you know, this culture of everyone being uh, an owner, right? And what are kind of the mechanisms that you can put in place? Uh, so, you know, for example, um, having labels, making it transparent, right? This whole culture of, of FinOps and there are people who are, you know, probably better specialized in FinOps that can talk about that. But I think that that is definitely something that applies here as well, right? And and we also wrote uh, a best practices guide actually specifically because we have seen this go wrong. Um, and that's not an experience mm. we would want, right? So I think those are maybe a few points, um, but I'll let Christoph, he's worked with several customers as well. So I'll give him, uh, let him add anything. Yeah, I want to hear yeah. the juicy uh, stuff, Christos. I want to <laughs> hear about blowing hundreds of thousands on a model or something where they left on <laughs> or whatever. Uh, but if you don't have it, it's all right, too. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it. I mean, you often get, you know, scenarios that, uh, you know, things are overseen and, and, you know, products might be misused in terms of like, maybe the, not the right governance uh, is in place. But of course, of course, we, we do. Uh, we do have ways of, of controlling that. It's, it's just sometimes people get too excited to jump on, on GCP and use things and, you know, without thinking of, okay, what's, what's the impact of that? Um, just to kind of expand a bit more on, on what Donna said, I think big organizations, global organizations, they, they have this kind of, a, it's a bit of a greater challenge when you think of MLOps because like small teams, and small organizations, they're very agile. So it's very easy to agree, okay, this is how we want to build MLOps. This is how the, the process of productionizing, of building code, testing the code, productionizing uh, everything. When it comes to big organizations, it's, you know, like that they operate on a global scale. Um, the challenge is building the right tools by listening to each local entity or different team within the organization, building something that then can be shared and used in a standardized way across the whole organization. And that convincing of using a specific pattern or architecture platform, that basically is, uh, it's a hard thing to do, right? Because it's not just, you cannot enforce it in that scenario. You, you just need to deliver the, the right things so that people themselves can say, actually, it's, it's much easier to build my models this way, or my kind of pipelines this way. We're getting there, but I, I think it's uh, that, that's a bit of a, of a challenge still. Yeah, I think. Excellent. Well, thank you both. Yeah. Go ahead, Donna. Oh no, just I was going to say actually to add to to what Christoph said, right? So we actually did um, an internal study, kind of looking at uh, you know what qualities do the best ML engineers have, right? And then, we have kind of the, the technical skills, so for example, distributed systems, like knowledge and understanding of testing, security, and so on. Um, but also one of the things that came out were kind of the, the soft skills, right? So strong communication skills, because you're working at this, this intersection of so many different teams. Um, and for example, having a humble approach, right? Because this is a, a dynamically changing landscape and also really knowing kind of what's good enough. And so I think that that kind of, uh, you know, points to what Christoph is saying, right? This uh, ability to work with so many different cross-functional teams. Oh, I love that. Is that uh, out for the public to see? Can we link to it? Um, I think it might have. Yeah, let me check. I think it's, uh, there was an article published on that as well. So I'll try to find that for you. Yeah, that's so cool. So sadly, we got to wrap, but <laughs> I really appreciate uh, this conversation. I appreciate you sharing these insights. And like more than anything, I think I super appreciate all the work you're doing in this field. 
and helping us to understand and helping us to see how you think through problems. I mean, the work that you're putting out is so beneficial for myself. I'll just speak for myself. I know Vishnu likes it too, but I'll let him talk about it on his own. Uh, and so I thank you for that. I also think that, you know, you could write a whole blog post or book about managing dependencies between different um, different tools, as you mentioned, that was one huge takeaway, and I would love to see that. That's a question we get quite a bit in the community also. Uh, but yeah. that's it. That's all we've got for today. Thank you again for coming on here, Christos and Donna. This was incredible. Yeah, thank you as well uh, for having us. And, you know, it's great to see the, the fantastic work that you're doing as a community. So, um, yeah, we enjoy seeing that too. I know there's actually a lot of Googlers who are also listening to your podcast. So uh, keep up the great work. Oh. Uh oh. See, that's news to us. <laughs> yeah. I better stop we, talking. We are watching you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, just, uh. <laughs> just a final comment for me. So I have, you know, the thought leadership that you guys put out. I have applied it in my companies, have taken, you know, read some of these papers and said, hey, we're at level zero. We need to get to level one. And, you know, and so I would just do want to second what Demetrius said in terms of it is hugely useful to the community. Thank you for sharing and thank you for coming on. That's great to hear. And Thanks. Are, are your teams hiring? I mean, Google's always hiring, right? But <laughs> are you all looking for people? Uh, I, I do think there are, within kind of solutions engineering, there are some uh, job openings at the moment. Cool, cool. So in case anybody out there listening wants to go and do some cool stuff with these people, you know <laughs> where to go and find it. That's all we've got for today. See you all later. Thank you. Thank you.